The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. It's ready, Dr. Mombrakis. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Chris Mombrakis. I'm a uh, neurologist and neurologist with the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group. Thank you for tuning in today to today's uh, webinar. Uh, it's going to be on epilepsy testing, common tests, how and why. We're going to run through a lot of material. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll uh, give you the links at the end of the uh, um, slideshow uh, where you can uh, send me any questions you have, and I'll be happy to answer them. We have uh, many webinars coming up. Uh, you can check the website for uh, dates and times. Uh, there's some of the upcoming webinars over the summer, uh, lots of different, different uh, interesting presentations that will be uh, given. Now today we're going to talk about epilepsy testing. We're going to run through some of the more common testing uh, that is utilized in treating patients with, with seizures. And we're also going to discuss why we do that. And the first one we're going to talk about is a brief overview of brain, the brain and seizures. This is the human brain, probably the most complex uh, device in the known universe, and everybody has one. The, the brain is composed of billions of neurons, and each neuron has thousands upon thousands of synapses. These are connections between the neurons. This enables the neurons to communicate this with other neurons in, uh, in the vicinity, and they do that through electrical, uh, uh, through conduction of electrical signals. The brain weighs about 2% of your total body weight, but it uses 20% of the energy requirement. So it's a very, very active organ. It has about 100,000 miles of blood vessels. It's made of uh, 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 water and fat. And this is the microscopic picture of uh, the brain cell, the neuron. And you can see the, the neuron here. And these are the connections to other neurons. These are where the electrical signals travel. And there's a, another picture of a neuron with other neighboring neurons, and it's conducting electrical signals to these, these neurons. And it's these electrical signals that 99.9% .9 of the time work fine, but on occasion, there can be an electrical irritation, an electrical storm that results in a seizure. And there are many different types of neurons depending on what area of the brain uh, one is looking at. And the way the neurons are laid out is specific for function. Uh, each, each area of the brain has been uh, mapped by scientists over the years, and we have a pretty good idea as to what specific regions of the brain do. Now, the brain is divided into to several lobes. You have the frontal lobe, which takes up a large area at the front of the brain. The, the eyes would be here. The ear would be here. And this is the back of the head. This is the top. This is the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is involved in many different things like concentration, understanding, uh, thinking, making decisions, problem solving, and personality. It's also a large area of the frontal lobe that is devoted to motor control. When you want to move your arm, this area here is activated. The parietal lobe sits behind that, and this is a sensory integration area uh, where things like pain and touch are processed. The temporal lobe is this area here that's involved in memory, language, emotion, and motivation. And the occipital region of the brain, which is involved in visual processing. Now, depending on where the seizure is originating from, you can see a whole host of different phenomena. For instance, if a seizure occurs in the motor area of the brain, which is right here in the frontal lobe, you'll see some sort of motor activity, shaking, tensing up of, of an extremity. If it's in a parietal region of the brain, you may see changes in, a person may experience changes in, in sensory uh, sensation, and they may feel something. Uh, if it's in the temporal lobe, the person may have problems with their memory, they may have problems with their speech. If the seizure is originating in the occipital region, they may have problems with vision. A picture of some of the various things the brain does. Now let's talk a little about seizures, and I, I thought it was important to talk about this because it 
forms the basis of everything what we do. We, we use the term seizure and epilepsy sometimes interchangeably. Seizures refer to a specific episode, while, while, uh, while epilepsy refers to a, a condition in which a person has recurrent seizures. Now, what is a seizure? A seizure is caused when one or more neurons, the cells of the brain, begin sending electrical signals, messages, that cause an inappropriate burst of electrical activity. On an EEG, this looks like an electrical storm. And when a neuron or a group of neurons are involved in this electrical storm, uh, they can't function normally. So whatever that area of the brain uh, was involved in, whatever its function was, uh, it, it, the brain uh, has difficulty uh, performing that same function. For instance, uh, certain uh, seizures uh, in the frontal lobe may, may affect a person's behavior or movement. In the parietal lobe, it may affect a person's sensation. And uh, during during the seizure, uh, a person may feel or move or think or act differently due to this disruption of the normal uh, neuronal circuitry. Now, the diagnosis of epilepsy. What what tools do we use to to diagnose epilepsy? Obviously, the history uh, and the clinical description of the events are very important. What did the patient experience during the seizure? That that's often a very big clue as to where the seizures are coming from within the brain. If a person reports that they have visual phenomena, so they see spots, uh, or they have difficulty seeing at the onset of the seizure, that would suggest that the seizure is coming from the, the occipital lobe. If a person has problems with, with their memory or language at the early onset of the seizure, that suggests the seizure was coming from the temporal lobe. So the description from the patient as to what, what they experienced at the start of the seizure is very important in helping us localize where the seizure was coming from. Also, the, the description of the seizure from somebody who may observe the seizure can be very important. For instance, if the, person's, the person was shaking, but then when you delve into the history a little bit more, it was the left, the left arm that was shaking. That, that helps us to localize more specifically where in the brain that seizure was coming from. So these little clues can be very helpful in determining where the seizure is coming from. And the other big test that we use is the electroencephalogram. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now we're going to focus on EEG monitoring. Now the EEG records the brain's electrical activity. Those, those, billion, those billions and billions of neurons giving off electrical signals, we, we are able to measure those and record those. Uh, and that is very helpful for determining where the seizure focus is. This allows for the classification of the seizure type. And there are many, many different types of seizures. So the EEG helps us to determine what type of seizure a person is having. And also it helps us to better understand where within the brain the seizures are coming from. Now here's a, uh, a typical uh, portable EEG machine. And there's several components here. We have the display screen where the uh, electrical information is displayed graphically. We have a uh, CPU computer where the, uh, where the program uh, resides that processes the, the information and then displays it on the screen. We have what's called a jack box, and this is where the uh, electrodes from, from the patient's head plug into and are then conveyed to the, the CPU. And we have a video camera that uh, allows us to, to go back and view exactly what was happening during, during a seizure if, if we are able to record one. These are the uh, electrodes that are placed over the, the scalp. They're a, a very small metallic uh, electrode that is uh, fixed to the, uh, the skin. This is a non-invasive procedure. We use some, uh, some uh, electrode conducting gel uh, to apply the electrode to the scalp and then fasten that down with, with sometimes glue and sometimes uh, uh, tape. And we just don't use one electrode. We use uh, around 20 electrodes. Are color coded, uh, and each electrode goes in a specific location on the surface of the, surface of the scalp. And here you can see a patient having uh, the electrodes uh, placed. You can see here a baby having a EEG with the electrodes uh, fixed. Now, each electrode uh, corresponds to a certain uh, anatomic landmark within the brain. Uh, and we have electrodes, the FP1 stands for frontal polar, uh, C stands for central region, P is parietal lobe, and O is occipital, and T is temporal. Uh, 
and we have the same thing on the other side. So we get a, we put a lot of electrodes down to record from all the different areas of the brain. And here's a, a side view of the various electrodes, and here's that frontal polar electrode and the temporal electrode, the parietal and occipital. And you can see we cover cover a lot of territory to record the brain's electrical activity. Some more examples of the electrode uh, placement. Now, what happens when we record this information? The, the electrodes pick up the electrical signals. Those are sent to the jackbox, which are then sent to the computer. The information is processed and displayed on the screen. And what we get when we look at a single electrode is a, uh, a, a line, which represents the, the, the change in electrical activity in that electrode. And the wave patterns can look uh, quite varied, depending on whether the patient's awake or asleep, or if they're having a seizure. And these are just some examples of the different types of wave patterns that we can see. Now, we just don't look at one or two electrodes. We look at a full complement of 20 plus electrodes. And this is, this is what a typical EEG screen would look like, where each one of these lines represents the electrical activity in a specific small region of the brain. And you can see here the, the, the various electrodes that are used. And you'll recall the, the various names, the, the frontal electrode and the temporal electrode and the occipital electrode. So this is covering a certain area of the brain. Um, each one of these uh, lines represents a specific area. And all the electrodes uh, together represents a pretty, pretty good uh, representation of the, of the surface of the, of the brain. Now, when we look at an EEG, we're also looking for things that are abnormal, things that stand out. And patients with, with seizures, many patients will have uh, evidence of electrical irritation, for lack of a better term. Electrical, these, uh, the, these neurons that are electrically excitable, where the seizures are coming from, often give off electrical discharges, uh, even if the person hasn't, uh, even if the person is not actively seizing. And in a patient who hasn't had a seizure in a long period of time, uh, will tend to have evidence of this electrical instability on their baseline EEG. And th these are the things that we, that we really scrutinize EEG for. Uh, the, um, the most common example is what we call a spike. Uh, and a spike indicates that there's an area that's electrically sensitive, electrically irritated. And we call it a spike because it looks, it looks like a spike. It's, it's this discharge that we see. Uh, it only lasts a few, a few milliseconds. Um, but when we see this, it's, this indicates that there's an area there that's electrically sensitive. And in this patient, this, this spike is coming from, from the frontal and temporal region on the left side of the brain. So we're able to, to know what, what area of the brain is electrically sensitive. And more than likely, that's where the patient's seizures originate from, even though this is not considered a seizure. Now, why do we do video EEG monitoring? Video EEG monitoring allows us to uh, record electrical uh, activity from the brain for long periods of time. For years, we were doing what was called a routine EEG, which is about a 30-minute procedure done in the office. The video EEG monitoring, particularly the inpatient video EEG monitoring, uh, allows us to record for, for several days, if necessary, to try and capture a seizure, because that information is just so important in helping to classify the seizure type and ultimately deciding what would be the most appropriate seizure medication. Also, with the advent of the video component, we're able to actually see the seizure, to see what the patient has been describing and observers have been witnessing. And that also helps us in seizure characterization and localization. Now here's a patient having inpatient video EEG monitoring. And you can see the, the electrodes on her head uh, and the, the computer that's monitoring the brain's electrical activity. And patients typically come to the video EEG monitoring unit uh, where they're admitted uh, and spend a few days with us uh, as we attempt to record uh, their baseline EEG for evidence of those spikes, as well as in some circumstances actually recording their seizures. And there are various different uh, layouts. Uh, some, some rooms are hardwired where the, where the uh, recording devices are uh, on the wall, on the ceiling. Here you have a, a camera that's, that's recording, and the uh, EEG information is actually plugged in directly to the wall, which then goes to a uh, control, control unit uh, where the information is, is displayed. Now also in the hospital, we rather than having 
these fixed rooms with monitoring. We have portable units, and these can go anywhere in the hospital. So if a patient is in a certain certain room within the hospital, uh, we can bring the machine, uh, the EEG machine, to them to record uh, the brain's electrical activity. Uh, recently, uh, outpatient ambulatory video EEG monitoring has become uh, very popular. This this uh, allows a patient to, to stay home rather than coming into the hospital and to record seizures <coughs> in a more um, more natural environment. Uh, the the patient would come to the office. The technician would uh, hook up the electrodes, and then the patient would would go home uh, with this uh, with this computer pack uh, and a, and a camera. Uh, a wireless setup, and uh, you would be able to obtain the same the same information, record their, their brain's electrical activity over the course of several days. Now let's review seizures again because it's it's so very important. Seizures seizures are caused by uh, an inappropriate burst of electrical activity, this electrical irritation generated from neurons. This electrical discharge can spread to other areas of the brain that aren't normally electrically irritated, and this results in the seizure. And when those neurons are actively seizing, when they're involved in this electrical storm, they can't function normally. So depending on what function those neurons serve, you're going to see a disruption of various types of uh, brain function, whether it's behavior, movement, sensation, or awareness. Now, we characterize seizures. There are many different types of seizures, but there's in general, two, two types of seizures, what we call the partial seizures and the generalized seizures. Now let's talk first. This is a, a, a normal EEG, which we uh, saw before. Each of these lines represents a certain region of the brain, and this is, this is a normal awake EEG. Now, during a partial seizure, we call it partial or focal seizure, there's a specific region of the brain that's involved in the seizure. And here we have a patient who's having this electrical storm in the temporal lobe. So this, this seizure we would suspect would affect possibly language, um, their, their, uh, their uh, emotion, uh, maybe affect their memory, maybe affect their awareness. Uh, and as the seizure spreads to different areas of the brain, you, you may see different, different things evolve clinically during the seizure. Here's another picture of that seizure. Now, what does what does a partial seizure look like on an EEG? So, here you have uh, this rhythmic discharging, this, and this is the the electrical storm. This is the neurons firing repetitively, and at this point, they're not functioning normally. And <coughs> as the seizure evolves, each each one of these lines is one second. So this page is about ten seconds. As the seizure evolves, more and more neurons begin firing. They get recruited into this electrical storm. And this is the seizure taking place. So during this span of 10 seconds where these neurons are firing, this is where we would expect to, s to see something clinically with the patient, whether they're confused or having difficulty speaking or having memory problems. Now, what is the other big type of seizure? It's what we term generalized seizures. These seizures are more widespread. It appears the entire brain is involved during a generalized seizure as opposed to the focal or partial seizure where only a specific region of the brain is affected. Generalized seizures tend to be more pronounced, more dramatic, because the entire brain is involved in the seizure. There's no, there's no part of the brain that's available to maintain consciousness. So these patients typically lose consciousness pretty quickly. And since there's widespread uh, electrical storming taking place, the, the motor areas of the frontal lobe are activated, and that's why you see the jerking. You may not necessarily see jerking during a partial seizure because the, if the motor area is not involved in the in the partial seizure, uh, that area will continue to function normally. Now, what does a generalized seizure look like on an EEG? So, rather than a specific region of the brain, like we saw before with the temporal lobe seizure, where only a few electrodes were involved in the seizure, all the electrodes are involved in the electrical storming. And here you can see that that rhythmic pattern. However, it's involving the, the entire brain. Here's another example of a, a generalized type type seizure. We have involvement of all the electrodes uh, on the surface of the scalp. Now, wh what are the goals of video EEG monitoring? Uh, the first first thing we want to uh, 
document is to, to, to make sure something's really an epileptic seizure. Sometimes uh, various things like like um, issues with uh, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, hormonal issues, uh, can, can mimic seizures. Uh, psychological events uh, can sometimes mimic seizures. So to the eye, it may look like a, a seizure. However, when we do their EEG, we find out that these are not seizures. These are, the, the episodes are not originating from the brain. So it's very important to distinguish what's what's a epileptic seizure versus something that is a non-epileptic event. Once we determine that it is an epilepsy, what what type of what type of seizure is it? There are many different types of seizures, uh, and we use the clinical history, the description of the seizures, and the electrical information to help us to to classify and characterize a seizure. And where within the brain does the seizure originate from? That's also very very important. And the EEG monitoring enables us to do that. Now we use several other tests, uh, which we'll speak about, to to investigate the validity of the focus that we determine by video EEG monitoring. For instance, if we determine that the seizures electrically are coming from the right frontal lobe, is there anything else uh, different about that right frontal lobe that would be causing the seizures? And we use these various tests like MRI and MRS and SPEC and PET imaging to really examine that, that area in more detail to see if there's any, anything different about that area structurally that would account for this electrical irritation that's causing the seizures. OK, we're going to talk about MRI imaging now, which is commonly used uh, in the evaluation of our, our patients. MRI imaging provides a structural assessment of the brain. It's, it's, if you're actually looking at the brain, we are, we're not looking at it microscopically. We're not looking at it electrically. We're looking at it structurally. We're looking at a picture of the brain, looking for various types of abnormalities that could predispose to seizures. And these, these are things like developmental abnormalities, congenital abnormalities, things that a person may have had since they were born, uh, area of scar tissue uh, that could be a focus for electrical irritation. And there are other things also that you know, when, a, when a person first presents with seizures that we quickly investigate, things like strokes and tumors. Uh, really anything that happens within the brain can, can, can cause a seizure. So when a patient first presents with seizures, there, there are many different things that we quickly uh, investigate and rule out. Now here's a, an, an MRI, uh, and we can see the different the different structures. Uh, the, the gray matter where the neurons sit is on the, the outer perimeter of the brain, and the white matter is in the inner part. And we can look for various types of uh, abnormalities. And here, this patient has what's called mesial temporal sclerosis, and there's an area here of scarring within the temporal lobe. And this, this predisposes the patient to the possibility of having partial temporal lobe seizures. So these are one of the things that we would look for on an MRI in a patient, uh, specifically a patient that has, has temporal lobe seizures. We're looking for that mesial temporal sclerosis. And here's, here's Homer Simpson. And the, the, there are two different types of MRIs. The first is what we call structural MRI. Uh, and the other is a functional MRI. The, the pictures we're just looking at were that of a structural MRI. It gives us the structure of the brain, the anatomy of the brain, and enables us to see um, various abnormalities on a structural basis. And the functional MRI allows us to, to better understand what areas of the brain uh, function as. Now here's a typical MRI scanner, which uh, utilizes strong magnetic fields uh, to, to image the body. Uh, one thing about the MRI is that it does not use or expose a patient to ionizing radiation. Uh, like other x-rays or CAT scans. Uh, the MRI just uses uh, these strong magnetic fields to generate the picture. Now how does it work? There's a lot of a lot of very complicated science that allows us to see these pictures. Basically, uh, it utilizes um, uh, protons, uh, which are found in uh, water, water molecules, which are quite abundant within the body, uh, within the brain. And the strong magnetic fields uh, turn these protons in different directions. And uh, when the protons are turned, they, they give off signals. And various computer algorithms then take that information and construct these highly detailed pictures of the brain. And here we have a patient who is imaged. And you can see the, 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 the amazing detail of, of the brain. Uh, here we have the gray matter, which is this gray, gray, gray area here where the neurons uh, reside. And this is, this is the, 
the uh, they, give, they give off the electric, electrical signals that we re record with the scalp electrodes. And you can see the various other deep regions within the brain, like the brain stem and the pons and the cerebellum. These are deeper regions of the brain that are not really involved in generating seizures, but it, it allows us to see a lot of detail within the, within the brain. Now, uh, one of the one of the advantages of using MRI is that we can we can really turn the the image any way we want and look look at various planes uh, that we're not restricted to looking at a specific area. We can we can look at different regions of the brain from different angles to to, to assess specific regions uh, within the brain, and we are able then to construct slices like this where we can see from from the top of the head all the way down uh, through through the through the brain. Uh, Looking for any kind of uh, abnormality. There's just some some other examples of the things that sometimes we we look for on on MRI imaging. This person had a had a stroke, and it's you can see the the area here of the stroke compared that to the other side, the normal side here. So when when something's happened within within the brain, whether it's a stroke or a bleed, uh, we can see that quite readily with the with the MRI imaging. And just some some more examples of various uh, changes that occur uh, within the brain here. We have a patient who had a stroke. And initially, this, uh, there's not a whole lot to see. However, as, as time goes on, we begin to see the, 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 the changes uh, within the brain. And this patient, because of this uh, stroke, could, could potentially have seizures as, as, as these areas were injured, scar tissue that develops. And that scar tissue can cause electrical irritation, which then can cause seizures. I'm going to talk about SPECT imaging. SPECT imaging stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. And what SPECT imaging allows us to do is to see the cerebral vascular perfusion. What does that mean? How much, what areas of the brain uh, utilize, um, I'm sorry, what, what areas of the brain uh, are perfused by, uh, by blood uh, during a seizure Areas that are involved in the seizure will be hyperperfused. That means they, 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 more blood is delivered to areas of the brain that are involved in the seizure. When a person is not having a seizure, the opposite happens. Those areas of the brain receive less blood flow than would be expected. And that enables us to, to uh, determine uh, where, where the seizures potentially could be coming from. So for this patient here, this is their baseline spec scan. Not a whole lot uh, to pick there. However, during the seizure, when we take the images during the seizure, you can see here that there's an area that lights up. So this area is receiving a lot of blood flow. And typically, that would be the area where the seizure was coming from, because that area is very metabolically active at that moment in time during the seizure and requires more blood flow. Next, we're going to talk about PET imaging. PET imaging stands for pos positron emission tomography. And the PET scan is a little bit different than the SPECT scan. The PET scan allows us to uh, assess the amount of cerebral metabolism. And by metabolism, we mean uh, the utilization of glucose. Glucose is the food of the brain. Uh, the brain uses glucose uh, to, to perform its various metabolic functions. Uh, so the PET scan is able to measure what areas of the brain are uh, metabolically active. Now, we don't do a PET scan during a seizure. However, the baseline EEG is, is very important because areas of the brain that are involved in propagating the seizure typically don't function as well as other regions. So they will be hypometabolic. So we will see that that area of the seizure, w w the, that area of the brain where the seizures come from, do not utilize glucose as well. And they'll be hypometabolic, less, less metabolism. Here, this patient, you can see here, if we compare the right side to the left side, you can see that this area just doesn't light up as much. This is a hypometabolic area. This area is not utilizing glucose as much as the other side of the brain. And sure enough, this is where the patient's seizures were coming from, in this, in this vicinity of hypometabolism. Now, why do we do all this? Uh, testing, the EEG monitoring, MRI, specs, and PETs. Why do, why do we do all this? There's really two, two main indications. The, the, the medication selection. Um, the, this various te testing allows the physician to determine 
the type of seizure or epilepsy a person is having. And that information allows us to choose the most optimal uh, uh, seizure medication for that specific type of, of seizure disorder. Now there are, thankfully we live uh, in a world where there are many different choices with regard to seizure medications. And some seizure medications work better for certain types of epilepsies. Um, on occasion, uh, certain anti epileptic medications can actually make seizures worse. So it's very important to understand the type of seizure a person is having before a physician begins prescribing seizure medications. Uh, there are many medications that work well for many different types of seizures, and those are often used early on when we're not 100% uh, sure as to what type of seizure someone's having. We'll, we'll use, very similar to an antibiotic, we'll use a broad spectrum seizure medication, seizure medication that covers a lot of different types of seizures. Uh, so the, the, those are often used uh, early on. And then once we, once we determine more precisely the type of seizure a person's having, then we can be a little bit more selective in picking specific medications that work best for that seizure type. I'm going to talk a little bit about epilepsy surgery. Now, not all patients are, are candidates for epilepsy surgery. Thankfully, many, many of our patients can be controlled with seizure medication. Uh, but for those patients that continue to have seizures despite being on uh, uh, several uh, seizure medications, epilepsy surgery is always something that, that is, is considered and patients are, are evaluated for because uh, patients, uh, patients in, uh, who are candidates for epilepsy surgery uh, can, can do very, very uh, well. Now, the, the various testing that we spoke about and how that relates to epilepsy surgery, the video EG monitoring allows us to determine the electrical focus of the seizures. We, we want to know where the seizures are coming from so that the surgeon can go in and actually remove that tissue that's causing the seizures. The MRI helps to verify that there's some sort of structural issue with that brain uh, in that vicinity. So for instance, in a patient that we monitor with video EG monitoring and see that they have a right temporal lobe seizures, we use the MRI to look for any kind of structural issue with the with the, uh, with the brain, like that mesial temporal sclerosis, the MRI that we saw early on, to verify that that's in fact where the, the structural issue is that's causing the electrical irritation. We use some other testing, MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which determines the, the composition of the lesion. Is it, is it a glyotic lesion? Is it, is it a scar tissue? We use the PET scan, which we spoke about, to identify regions of abnormal metabolism, areas of the brain that don't utilize glucose as well as other areas. And we use the SPECT scan to, to tell us what areas of the brain are not, uh, are, are not uh, receiving as much blood flow as would be expected. There are other various tests that we use in evaluating patients for epilepsy surgery, and these are primarily uh, geared for uh, avoiding neurologic deficits. Obviously, if we're going to be removing an area of the brain uh, where the seizures are coming from to stop the seizures. We don't want to remove areas that are, that are uh, important. Uh, so there are various tests, checks and balances that we use to, to determine uh, whether it would be safe to remove that, that area of the brain. And these are just some of the various tests. So WADA test is a, a test that's conducted to help us better understand where within the brain speech and memory uh, it resides and whether, whether there would be significant deficits following surgery uh, in speech and memory. Neuropsychological testing allows us to, to test IQ and memory, personality assessment, to see how the seizures or the seizure medications have, have impacted the patient. And this is often repeated after the epilepsy surgery to see, uh, to see if there's been any changes uh, either from the, uh, the surgery itself or in many cases uh, uh, the, the, uh, reducing the, the seizure frequency actually has a positive effect and uh, various uh, cognitive uh, uh, processes within the brain. So for some patients, we may see some, some improvements in some of these things after the surgery. And cortical mapping is something that we, that we do uh, towards the end of the, 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 the evaluation, where we actually stimulate different areas of the brain uh, to, to determine what, what their function is. And that's, that's a, uh, a droplet procedure. Let's talk briefly about blood work. Uh, it's a term that you hear very frequently, pretty much at every office visit. And physicians often order blood work, and we look for things like the complete blood count, the WBC, the hemoglobin, the platelets. We check the chemistries, electrolytes, such as sodium, potassium, kidney, and liver function. And the reason we do that is that 
on, on, a, on, on rare occasions, seizure medications can affect these, these various um, uh, uh, levels. Uh, so it's important to have these monitored. And for most patients, we check them several times a year, maybe three or four times a year. We, 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 we send out blood work uh, for these various things, looking for, for any early indication of any, any problems. Uh, and we also check the seizure medication levels, which are very important. Now, what, why do we check medication levels of the, uh, the seizure medications? Thankfully, most most uh, seizure medications were actually able to send a sample of the blood to the lab and get a get a number back from the lab as to how much how much of the medication is um, is present in their blood, and that's very important because it's the it's that amount of medication that's being delivered to the brain to exert its anti-seizure properties. And the therapeutic range is determined from uh, testing thousands and thousands of patients and determining what what's the best level blood level of seizure medication to have good seizure control with minimal side effects. Uh, if it's too high of a level, the patient is going to have potentially have side effects. And if it's too low of a level, it's not going to be enough seizure medication to control their seizures. So the therapeutic range is a, a, a low number and a high number, uh, which which tells us where we should be for most patients to have good seizure control with minimal side effects. Now, how much a person, how much medication a person takes is important. However, what's more important is the blood level, how much is being delivered to the brain. And everyone is different. Everyone has different absorption in their GI tract. Everyone absorbs a different amount of medication. Everyone has different metabolism. Or everyone, everyone metabolizes or, or excretes the medication at different rates. So a person, you can have the same dose of medication with a different person, and you're going to have a different level. You, it's very difficult to predict what their blood level is going to be based on how much medication a person is taking. Now, each, each seizure medication, when we get it back from the lab, has its own unique therapeutic range. For instance, Dilantin, the range is typically between 10 to 20. So we, we aim for that, that window between 10 and 20. If the level's less than 10, it's, it may not be enough seizure medication for, to control their seizures. If the level's above 20, they may have side effect issues. But it's important to state that we treat the person, not the range. Some patients can have levels of Dilantin, say, of 8, and that's, that's enough for them. They have good seizure control, and in that patient, we would not recommend increasing it. Some patients were actually able to, to go above 20, so we may be able, we may be able to have a, a patient uh, uh, with a level of 25 and, and not exhibit any kind of side effects. So everyone's different, but in, in general, the, the, the therapeutic range is where most people need to be. And that will conclude uh, tonight's lecture. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Um, please check our website, www.epilepsygroup.com, uh, with links for uh, contacting me. And the next uh, webinar is May 27th with uh, Dr. Wu, and she'll be talking about uh, Epilepsy 101. Uh, it's in Chinese, though. Uh, but there are many, uh, many subsequent uh, webinars uh, in English and Spanish as well. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for tuning in. Have a good night.